Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Didier Morelli, and I'm a student at Simon Fraser University. Um, I don't have much of a long introduction to give uh, for Professor Cornett. Uh, to a certain extent, I assume a lot of people here have read about the event and have his basic bio. Uh, what I basically wanted to say you know, leading into this is that I met Professor Cornett about six years ago at a, a film screening of uh, the film that Alanis Abamsawin made. Um, and uh, it was at the NFB in Montreal. Uh, and uh, the film went through, and some of you might have seen it, and some of you might have not. And if you haven't, I strongly suggest you do, especially in the current sort of uh, socioeconomic climate around universities. But the film went on to a Q&A period, which was quite an extensive one, and Professor Cornett uh, went on to answer questions. And uh, I felt compelled to ask a question because I was the only um, person in the room who was under the age of 35, and this was a film that was dealing with students at McGill University. So I asked a question about what I could do as a student, uh, as a member of a generation who he was teaching, uh, because I, I was sort of wondering how I could feel empowered. And Professor Cornett went on to, um, I, I can't really do it justice, but went on to explain to me that I had all the power to basically make the changes um, that, that, he was, that he was talking about in the movie and that, that were sort of being addressed. And I remember at the time being really moved by it and sort of wondering how it would be that at some point maybe I could do this. And uh, in finally finding a way to bring Professor Cornett to Vancouver, which we've been trying to do for two years, uh, I think that somewhat I might have found one way to do that. Uh, so it is my a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Norman Cornett, who is... Um, going to lead a dialogical session with us tonight. Uh, and I've never participated in one, so I can't really give you much of a description of it. But uh, I hope everyone tonight has a wonderful evening. Please welcome me in greeting Professor Cornett. Yes, indeed, folks. Thank you for coming this evening. And this is not going to be a lecture. It's going to be a collective conversation that we pursue through various catalysts that we'll present over the course of the evening. Um, some of them written, and I'll hand them out. Uh, some of them uh, visual, audiovisual, um, through um, the art of film. And because it's a collective conversation and we want to encourage dialogue, we invite you to please come up close. It's a lot easier to hear each other when you're making uh, uh, comments, when you have questions that you want to pursue. Um, and there's all these empty seats. Uh, so I, I don't watch these, but there's this expression I see on TV all, all the time in these game shows, come on down. So please come on down so that we can have this collective conversation. Um, for those who've just walked in, um, I, we uh, have circulating now two pieces um, of paper so that we can continue the dialogue. We'll initiate it this evening, um, and we can continue it thanks to the Internet, to the web. There's a dedicated site for this. Um, and uh, if you write large and legible your email um, and your name will we'll stay in contact. So without um, further ado, I'm going to um, present a short excerpt and that will be the icebreaker for the, the first catalyst in this collective conversation. Um, so uh, I would like to, um, before that screens, thank uh, Simon Fraser University for this gracious invitation. Uh, in particular, um, the SFU Gold Corp Center here, um, Mr. Am Yohal, uh, Ms. Uh, Andrea Kramer, um, and those who are assisting in recording this so that others can participate, uh, Jessica, who's working with us uh, uh, on the tech end, and Alex, who's filming. Alex, are you reading me loud and clear? <laughs> okay. Um, and um, I would like to particularly thank, he was being uh, unduly modest, um, artist, critical theorist, and uh, completing his Master's of um, Fine Arts here at Simon Fraser University, Mr. Didier Morelli, who got the ball rolling uh, so that this could happen. Many thanks. So, without further ado, we'll go to, uh, these are going to be short and sweet, so turn on your radar and soak in as much as you can.
So what's your opinion on modern art? Uh, it's hard to put into words, really. I, I just know what I care for and, and what I don't. Like this, I don't know how to pronounce it, Mira? Miro. Miro. I don't know why, but I, I just adore it. The feeling it gives. I know that sounds terribly vague. No, no, actually it confirms something I've always wondered about modern art, abstract art. What is that? That perhaps it's just picking up where religious art left off. Somehow trying to show you divinity. The modern artist just pairs it down to the basic elements of shape and color. But when you look at that Moreau, you feel it just the same. Why, wow, that's lovely, Raymond. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the first catalyst to get this collective conversation going on aesthetics and spirituality. Um, and in this dialogue, there is one principle. The operative principle of our dialogic session is the following. There's only one wrong question. That's the unasked question. So, I would like to invite you, and I will engage you. What would you like to ask about that clip that you just saw? And please, let's make the most of the moment. Yeah, and, and Andrea, um, Andrea, and I believe someone else will have a mic. I'll give you mine. So, what does it have to do with psychoanalysis? Um, psychoanalysis. Now, here you're referring to the intro that's on the SFU website. Well, I'm a religious studies scholar by training, and I got very interested, and that's why I wanted to show this clip. Have any of you, do you know this film? The film is called Far From Heaven. I highly recommend uh, you, take a uh, you take the opportunity to see Far From Heaven. And it's no secret that mainline uh, Christian denominations are empty. When you go to the churches, there's hardly anybody there. And I began to ask myself as a religious studies scholar, where has the spirit moved? Where now do we find spirituality? If we're not finding it in the mainline institutional, doctrinal religions, where can we locate spirituality? And that's why uh, I wanted to use this particular clip, because in fact, what Raymond proposes is that a paradigm shift has occurred from traditional religion through art as spirituality. And uh, Permit me here as a religious studies scholar to throw out a few terms for what they're worth. This is specifically from scholastic theology, the theology of the Middle Ages, in particular that of Thomas Aquinas, who, like many of the great thinkers uh, of the medieval era, addressed the gamut of human knowledge and experience. And here's two terms that uh, are used in, in Latin in scholastic theology in Thomas Aquinas. Essa. Essa essentially means being or existence, the essence. And another, its counterpart, forma. Referring to the shape, the form, the, the actual structure of the being of the existence. And what, what I believe this uh, clip that we just saw addresses is how the substance of spirituality has changed form. It's still the same being, the same existence, but it has changed its form. Now, you're asking what is the relationship uh, with psychoanalysis. In my own research, writing, and publication, I wanted to find out how did this paradigm shift occur? What takes place for us to move from the traditional forms of religion to 
spirituality that has taken on new shapes, new forms, new structures. And here, um, the seminal child psychiatrist, D.W. Winnicott, proved the key for me. Because uh, Winnicott, uh, specializing in child psychiatry, he wanted to understand how does a newborn make the link between the womb and the world, between the internal and the external. And he proposes through transitional objects. For example, in popular culture, um, we have Linus, um, uh, the, the Peanuts uh, comic strip. And Linus has a blanket that he always has with him. That blanket is a transitional object enabling Linus to negotiate, to mediate, to come to terms with reality. Or um, the, the woman, the mother's breast, uh, Winnicott proposed as a transitional object. Well, I elaborate on that notion of the transitional object, and in fact, I argue that the arts create a transitional space from the material to the spiritual realms, so that the aesthetic, in reality, constitutes the threshold of spirituality. So this is what uh, got me in, into working with figures such as um, the thought of D.W. Winnicott, and I, many of the dialogic sessions that I lead are with prominent psychiatrists and psychologists who, as fate would have it, uh, often are artists as well. Yes, um, could we get, oh, thank you. I'm curious, does that make artists effectively priests or shamans? Are they the new shamans? Or is this something that we imbue upon art? Uh, very good question. Um, this is also, as a religious studies scholar, um, let's take the notion of the prophet. Now, if you if you're want to read the Bible, the prophets are heavy dudes. We often have in popular, in popular culture the notion that prophecy or the prophet is someone who foretells the future. In reality, if you look at the prophetic role played by different figures, for example, in the Bible, most of what they address is what's gone wrong somewhere down the line, as the Doobie Brothers would say it. Something's gone wrong somewhere down the line. What's coming down? Where are we at as a people, as a community, as individuals? And they're challenging us morally, ethically, and as a society. So yes, I do believe that the artist can play a prophetic role. Um, part of this is because of artistic license which is a great thing, because I, I work with a number of artists in different fields, for example, literature. And some of the top writers, authors, uh, novelists, poets, short story writers here in Canada, um, they will, in our dialogic sessions, it becomes very clear that the reason they gravitated to fiction or to poetry or to short stories is because it enabled them to say, even though these are professors, they hold doctorates, and, and all, it enables them to say what, what they could not say in any other medium. So I believe that is, that is part of uh, the explanation for why the artist can play a prophetic role. Not foretelling the future, though they can. I mean, look at William think of William Blake, who's both a poet and an artist, you know, the, 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 the way that he's really calling down on the industrial era England of what, is, what matters in our industrialized society. And he's, he, calls, he calls the English people back who are now beginning their empire and their industry that is taking over the globe. He's calling them back to a spiritual understanding of the human condition beyond the commercial, beyond um, the economic. That is a prophetic role. He does this both in his, in his visual art as he does in his poetry. Uh, yes. Um, 
And thank you very much for these questions. This is what we're talking about. So uh, just to come back to the clip and the, uh, uh, I guess the uh, statement that abstract art uh, or the abstract artist is actually seeking spiritual or uh, to get back to a spiritual state. So uh, has the abstract art then failed as well? Because it has remained inaccessible for the majority of people, mm -hmm. uh, as she's to some degree. I mean, Kandinsky or all these, they are not, in reality, mm -hmm. abstract art has remained in the art galleries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most people go there, um, I think, and just look at it. They don't have a spiritual experience because mm -hmm. they see it like, you know, well, I can do that. I can throw paint on a, on a, mm -hmm. on a canvas. Mm -hmm. So um, is this, how do you see that? How does abstract art bring spirituality to, to, the, to the people? Well, first of all, any movement has a, a shelf life. And it could, it could prove the case that abstract art has run its course. That's one proposition that we need to consider. Another is the fact, now, and, and here I'm going to be very clear. What is the difference between art and object, between image and object? I would argue that if it's art, it communicates. And if it does not communicate, I believe we have a case for saying this is object or this is image. But it is not necessarily art. If you can't communicate, you can't create art. So there is a sense in which it becomes, you're quite right, hermetic. It becomes self-enclosed, if not self-indulgent. And if it's not, this takes us back to the prophetic rule. The prophet, uh, where's that? Oh, we got a black man now, great. <laughs> Art does not happen in a vacuum. Art does not take place in vacuo. If we remove art from the community, from the society, from the people that it endeavors to communicate to, then we have undermined the very prophetic role of art. Um, now, there, there, there's much more that you brought up, uh, but. Uh, maybe I can follow that up sooner uh, in, in a bit. And this gentleman had his hand up. I had a similar question, but I was going to use the example of music and say concert halls. Uh, I'm trained in music. Classical music, concert halls are empty as well. But uh, I think you got to my question there. I have an, another question, and that is could you... We're going to go to music in okay. the next clip. Great. Um, could you just clarify for me a bit, um, maybe just the idea of institutionalization, um, perhaps uh, spirituality versus religion, just so that I can understand a bit more about how we're framing or what our territory is here. Well, two of the prime vectors um, of religion are doctrine or dogma. There is a corpus that is considered... Um, untouchable, and the other vector is institutionalization. So we want to take these ideas and we want to put them into practice, and we do so through the institutionalization of the dogmas, of the doctrines, of the ideas held. Whereas spirituality, I believe, is a reflection, a mirror of the entire spectrum of the human condition. And this is why art lends itself to spirituality. Because the reality is that the dogmas, we can't always square the dogmas and the doctrines with what we experience as human beings. And the institution doesn't necessarily respond to the full gamut of lived human experience. On the contrary, and this is where I, I make a distinction between theology and ideology. Um, I did my PhD on the relationship between religion, culture, and politics. What strikes me in ideology is, here's my idea, and I'm going to make reality fit my idea. If you look at Bolshevik uh, Soviet Union, the revolution, they were trying to take an entire country 
and make it fit into their ideas. I believe spirituality, it's, it's not unlike th this verse in the Bible. Uh, humans are not created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for humans. And I think turning the tables, that's the difference between religion and spirituality. Spirituality corresponds to our, what psychologists call, felt needs. And this brings me back to Pierre's question. Did you notice one word that is repeated a few times in that clip that Raymond repeats? Feeling. He repeats it a few times. We felt it in, in traditional Christian art or medieval art. Now we feel it in Miro, in modern abstract art. What is Raymond communicating there? That if it's art, it touches the affective dimension of our humanity. And if it does not reach the affective dimension, Pierre, I would argue that's why it becomes sterile and hermetic and why it doesn't communicate. If it doesn't reach and respond and indeed stimulate the affective dimension, I think there's a case for saying it's object, perhaps. It's image, yes. It's not necessarily art. Now, I, I, speaking because the gentleman there mentioned music, I'm old enough to remember a group called The Fifth Dimension. And they had a song in which one of the lyrics is, you gotta feel it. I believe that's part of object or image morphing into art. That somehow it evokes feelings. It touches the affective dimension. And if it doesn't, it's like water off a duck's back. You know, if you can see a piece of art and not uh, something called art, an object or an image, and see it and then walk out and never think about it again, I think we have to ask ourselves about the nature of this. Object, image, and, or is it art? But if, you, if it's hooked you, as they say in the music industry, every, they want every album, every CD to have a hook. Does it have a hook? And I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that that hook is the affective dimension. Now, we're, a lot of questions. Uh, yes. Um, just a question about the dichotomy of dogma and spirituality. And I mean, I'd like to be hopeful, but I doubt, well, I have a doubt that you can really perpetrate spirituality without dogma because spirituality and mysticism is extremely subjective experience and you need to reach out and communicate that experience somehow and by communicating you implicitly entrench a dogma which you communicate and I do not see how you could really have spirituality without some sort of um, understanding of what it is that you're communicating which will then become an institution and become crystallized. Well, that's a very good question, and as somebody who, who's a church historian, um, we know, and we're just going to talk about two traditions, let's say. We know in the history of Christianity that the mystics were looked on askance. Think of Meister Eckhart, who's in central Germany, you know, in the 1100s, 1200s, in, in that, that, that part of the Middle Ages. Um, and was in the area of Erfurt, Germany. Uh, I've gone there several times to, to look into his work. Or think of um, John of the Cross. Many of these people come perilously close, or Julian of Norwich and others, they come perilously close to excommunication. Why is that? Because they will not limit their spirituality to the theological agenda of the institution, of the church. Now, incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at Islam. How do we understand, understand Shia and Sunni? How do we understand the various branches of the Shia? 
The key, folks, is mysticism. Mysticism is that thin edge of the wedge that pushes the dogma and the institutions beyond their established parameters and challenges them to a deeper understanding. Uh, this gentleman has his hand up. I would like to propose a different way to um, phrase what you're saying. Uh, feeling, feeling can, can be just sort of a feel-good feeling. Could, would it be right to say a feeling, quote-unquote, that opens us up? When I say feeling, I'm speaking here in psychological terms. I'm, that's why I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm saying the film uses the word feeling. Had Raymond said, well, yes, this is what art does. It reaches the affective dimension. It wouldn't be in a Hollywood film. That said, the gamut of human emotions is not always about feeling good. When, I say, when he says feeling, or I refer to the affective, I'm not talking about some sort of a liver quiver here that I'm feeling good, I'm feeling all shook up. I'm talking about it's reaching into the depths of my soul or spirit or consciousness, whatever you want to call it. I'll give you an example. I've, for 22 years, I've collaborated with native artists. It can be really tough looking at some of the native art that we've dealt with. There's an artist called Glenna Matouche, who's Ojibwe, um, but has also uh, now has a cogent relationship with the Mohawk. Um, Glenna Matouche, much of her art deals the, with the phenomena of life on the reserve, of alcoholism, drug abuse, um, gambling, the casinos, and the suicide of some of her closest friends. The feelings this evoke are certainly not good. And I took an entire class of university students. I became very uncomfortable, ladies and gentlemen, talking about the abstract aboriginal, about the theoretical native, as though these people lived on the other side of the cosmos. I live in Montreal. It's a 30-minute drive to Ganawaga, which is, which is a major location of the, of the crisis that happened that brought out the army, that brought out, uh, I mean, you know, this made world headlines. From downtown Montreal, it's 45 minutes to Oka, the Oka crisis, to Kanastaki. So what, what has struck me in native art is its prophetic role. In your face, this is what's coming down in native communities. And it doesn't feel good. But it's, they're, they're in, impelling us, I should rather say compelling us, to face the native condition to face the reality of natives in this country. Other questions are coming. Um, we're going to try and make sure everybody at least gets to ask one question. This gentleman here. We have eight clips tonight, so I hope, I don't know if we're going to get through them. And then we have some other material. Yes, sir. What was the significance of the look on the, the face of the girl, young woman we were showing at the beginning of the clip? Um, the, the young African-American girl? Um, well, now, mea culpa, I'm an American. <laughs> this happens in the States. I was born in 1950. I'm a child of the civil rights movement. I was never allowed to, be, to go to school with black children. No black children lived in our neighborhood. There was, you know, we think of South Africa in apartheid. There was de facto apartheid separate but equal, and keep in mind that is only struck down in the 50s when um, uh, Earl Warren is Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, and as soon as uh, Supreme Court of the United States, as soon as he, he comes down with the Topeka versus Board of Education, which ends separate but equal, Dwight Eisenhower, the president who appointed him, said, I should never have made him Chief Justice. So. The significance was showing us, that's why I'm recommending this film. If you want to understand what it was like to be black and white in America in the 1950s, and how even children 
there can be no contact. She dares to point out what's wrong with the paper airplane they've made, and she's immediately dismissed because she's black and because she's a girl. So, and, and, the, and the film deals a lot with race relations. So, um, other questions, comments, observations? Please, folks, let's make the most of the mo uh, Okay. So Pierre uh, Bourdieu has argued that there is high art. Pierre Bourdieu. Yeah. So he has argued that there is high art and low art. So how would you explain them the spirituality of people who, due to lack of um, cultural capital, cannot understand high art or thus being affected by the um, abstract art? Well, first of all, Bourdieu is coming from, not unlike his contemporary Michel Foucault, he's coming from a power structure uh, paradigm. And he's looking at where power resides. And of course, both of these scholars are heavily informed by Marxist thought, class structure. Now, I want to point out, in respect to this gentleman, and we're going to see another clip, what we're dealing with in that very short clip is class privilege class distinctions, class structures, and by virtue of race, you ipso facto possess certain power, certain privileges that the black person does not. Um, your question is provocative. Could it in fact be the case that spirituality breaks through those barriers, those distinctions? those class structures. I'm throwing that out as a question. Uh, I'm a religious studies scholar and I'm very loath to speak in terms of this is the gospel truth. <laughs> but I think we can ask. Now, the, you know, cultural critics would challenge the whole notion of high art and low art. I'll give you an example because the gentleman over there mentioned music. Um, I work a lot with composers and musicians for 20, well, it'll be the, seven, the 17th year this summer that for two weeks, all the composers and musicians of the jazz world come to Montreal. And so I lead dialogic sessions with them as they come to Montreal. Um, and how would I put this? I think I want to ponder it more before I, I pursue it. Um, I think art, jazz, was one of the first art forms where they broke through the color barrier. Benny Goodman, for example, was, one, was the first band leader to have blacks up front in his band. Uh, believe it or not, folks, until then, when blacks and whites recorded in the recording studio, there was a wall, there was a curtain drawn between the black and the white musicians because they could have no contact. I encourage you to look at a, um, a historic label because ethnomusicology will inform us well here, um, of Okia records. You know, they used to be called race records. So th there were, we're back to the structures. Jazz had a way of mixing up the deck of cards, the class structures. Yes, um, you have a question there. Thanks. I'm having a hard time reconciling this notion of art being able to break down class barriers, but at the same time, we're sitting here talking about the artist basically saying that he's this male white genius when ever since 1954 we might as well put a pollock up there artists have worked to completely rid this very notion of the male artist genius i mean this is what greenberg has said and this is what artists since greenberg have worked to 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 work against to dismantle and we're sitting here talking about what greenberg was saying 50 years ago and that's very problematic it's universalizing um to, to talk about art having this ability. It's incredibly subjective. So I'm just wondering how we can, in a more responsible way, talk about art without privileging 
the male white artist as genius? Um, well, first of all, um, I didn't mention a specific artist as Moreau. the male white. Pardon me? Moreau. Oh, no, no. Okay, in the film clip, I see what you, the, the Catalan artist. Um, and I'm not saying art always does this. I'm saying art can do this. There's a big distinction there. I'm not saying because it's art, it automatically does this. Because we're not, we haven't even yet talked about the commercial dimensions of art. And when you want to talk about power structures, that's a, that's a whole other ball game here. Um, and there are prophetic artists. I mean, uh, women, non-white, um, you know, so, so we're just beginning to open up this dialogue here. Um, right here, Emily Carr, the influence she had. Who is incredibly problematic in many ways. I didn't. She was problematic in many ways. I mean, she herself is universalizing. Uh -huh. um, I'm just saying that we need to be a little bit more clear about how we are addressing this definition of art. Okay. An artist. Fair enough. Fair enough. Good. Call us to the carpet. <laughs> that's that's point well taken. Now, folks, um, I'm not sure how much material we'll be able to get through, but I am elated by the, your questions and comments. Um, so, um, we're going to have a paradigm shift right now. I'll have something that I'll hand out to everybody, uh, or maybe Andrea and uh, Didier can help hand it out. And today's date, the 13th of February, 2014, at the top of it, since we talked about music, we're going to do uh, something retro here. Now, we have three children, all adults now. I don't know how many times I heard a group when they were younger called New Kids on the Block. So now, ladies and gentlemen, with this piece of paper, we're going to continue the dialogue, as New Kids on the Block would say, step by step. So if you'll make sure you have a copy of it, and that your name's there, all we ask is that you write large and legible. And it does not matter about spelling. It does not matter about grammar. And it doesn't even matter about syntax, better known as sentence structure. We're just asking for an honest, gut-level, intuitive response. So, would you please read what's there and write the first word that comes to mind after you read that. One word to encapsulate what you've read there. Have a piece of paper now and a pen. And if you make sure you just write one word about that. Can I just see a show of hands of who's done that? So we know we're all on the same page here. Now, would you please write one sentence about that? A sentence is simply a verb and a noun. No, no. You just write a sentence about that. sentence about the text that you have in front of you. This is not a quiz. 
It's not a midterm. It's not a final. It's not an exam. This isn't an essay. You cannot crash and burn and go down in flames. Just give us an honest answer. And as long as you write large and legible, it's fine. Now, even if you're in mid-sentence, if you have a dangling participle, don't worry about it. We'll go to the next step. Would you please write one paragraph about that text? A paragraph is simply two or more sentences. Now, are we lacking pencils or pens? Okay, we'll get some. Don't be shy. If you're missing anything, let us know. And if you'll stop there and just skip a little down, and we're going to move into stream of consciousness. Write everything that goes through your mind about that text. We'll only have a little bit of time to do it, so let it rip. Put the pedal to the metal, as long as it's large and legibly written.
And since we're in a very high-tech mode now, and they actually publish entire novels that consist of these, would you please tweet this text? That is to say, you only have 124 characters. Please write a tweet about this text in 124 or less characters. And a space counts as a character. Stop there. Now, I'd like to mention uh, um, why a tweet. Uh, it's very interesting to see what some of the foremost poets are doing. Um, how the phenomena of technology is changing their poetry. What particularly draws me to poetry is that it is, in fact, an economy of means. It's saying the most with the least, and which explains why many poets have moved and, short, and others have moved in to this phenomena of tweets and publishing them. But I mention this also because it's minimalism. And that's really what Raymond refers to in that clip, that you've pared it down to the essa, to the essence. You've removed the elaborate, the ornate, and you've got right down to the pith. And the, this young lady has very rightly pointed out the role of women artists. One artist with whom I've had the privilege of working with the documentary filmmaker that made the um, foremost film um, on this artist, and you probably, she's one of the most well-known minimalists, is Agnes Martin. A Canadian by birth, incidentally, um, but um, spent much of her career in the United States. Agnes Martin works in an abstract, if not geometric form, very much minimalist. But what um, I, I worked with the filmmaker at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts on Agnes Martin. And the reason we did this is because of the spirituality that Agnes Martin believed in, infused her work. And I proposed in the conference that we did that in actual fact, Agnes Martin is a quietist. A quietist is a form of minimal, is a form of spirit, of mysticism. And when you, I mean, her, her canvases can suck you in and take you deep through very minimal structures and colors. And there is a sense of meditation, of contemplation in her art. There are a number of interesting studies done on her, the relationship they theoretically proposed between Buddhism or the principles of Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and the art of Agnes Martin. But there are so many other women artists that we could talk about. Georgia O'Keeffe, Frida Kahlo, Louise Bourgeois, uh, Geneviève Cadieu, Kiki Smith, who I've had the privilege of meeting with. I mean, there are many, you're quite right, very significant women artists, so we don't want a privilege. That said, let's now dialogue about what you've just read. Do any of you recognize this, this text? Do any of you, have you come across it before? Well, let me tell you where, who, who, who wrote this. Anish Kapoor. He's a sculptor. 
born in Bombay, India in 1954. He moves to London where he goes to the Hornsey um, College of Art and then to the um, Chelsea School of Art and goes on to um, represent Great Britain at the Venice Biennial to win the Tate Award. Now his works are in the Tate. Uh, and last year he was knighted uh, for his contributions. If you're in Chicago, you go to Millennium Park, you'll see the commissioned work Cloud Gate, also by Anish Kapoor. Um, and I'd invite you now to ask some questions about what Anish Kapoor has written there. Your thoughts on it. Questions, comments, observations. Well, my first, my first response was the word idealistic. And, and I, I think because I can identify with this desire, maybe there was something about it that triggered me a little bit, but um, I guess I, you know, for me, to, to desire to, to make art about something that is outside of material experience is impossible in a way. It, it's, it's impossible to achieve because everything that we experience is within our bodies, is within our atmosphere. And, you know, historically the split between the body and mind, between the, the idea that spirituality is something that exists outside of our, of our material realm, and we sort of polarize these two um, aspects of our being. We, we you know, this reverence of that which is transcendent, which is not part of our material world, and, and everything that is materialist is sort of just not quite as good. And, uh, and so I'm just, I'm just curious about, about the split that, that he's proposing between um, outside of material realm and form. And for me, you know, is it possible that some of what he wants to, to make sculpture about um, could come within, within form. Can we find that in form? I think so. Well, thank you for that. And, and, and I think you're quite right. In fact, the reason I propose this as a catalyst for our collective conversation is because very often we operate with what I call false dichotomies. Spirituality is always embodied. It always has material form. To, to make a separation, to divorce the material and the spiritual is to commit a false dichotomy. And the reality is, as embodied creatures or in carne, in fleshed beings, our entire relationship with the spiritual takes place through the material. What is interesting in Kapoor's quote here is he's saying, yes, there is the material, but I'm aiming beyond the material. The material is the means. It's not the end. And you use the word quite rightly. Transcendent. Transcendence means beyond the material but there's no way to get there. How do you get to Sesame Street? How do you get to spirituality? Only through the material. Only through the incarnate, in the, through the embodied. Now, we're going to try and let people who haven't had a chance to ask a question. Did you, you had a question? First of all, I just, Anish Kapoor here as a sculptor with his desire to make something that is outside of material concern is responding to this, you know, modernist practice which, you know, has been about making the work about the medium. So abstraction um, 
you know, of course, you've got people like Kandinsky, which had a basis in theosophy and uh, all that stuff. Of course, there's a spiritual element, but the medium is, uh, the abstraction is about the medium. It's about making paint about paint, sculpture about sculpture. So let's stop making, you know, uh, trying to um, imitate three dimensional space on a two dimensional canvas, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm worried that there's a conflation here with when you were talking about the embodied and an embodied exper experience with the fact that what he is talking about here is something that has not, he's not, he doesn't want to limit his sculpture to just about whatever the sculpture is made of, right? So the stone, the wood, the, you know, whatever installation he's yeah, You're quite right. About, it's right? not an either or. Right. It's a both and. Yes, there is, there is the concern that we only, we only achieve through the material means the transcendent, but at the same time as a sculptor who's very tactile, material based, the properties of the materials that he's working with, yes. They're, I'm, they're, I'm just having trouble reading this as spiritual. Because um, before you mentioned that unless, you know, a work of art can, you know, it, can it be called art if there isn't some sort of affective response, which to me is a little bit problematic because as the gentleman pointed out, and it was a very good question, how inaccessible abstract art is, people will stand in, for, in front of a Mondrian and go, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And that does not mean that a Mondrian is not a work of art, you know? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it, I'm, I'm having, I find it a little bit problematic making such a narrow definition of, um, and a very subjective definition of what That was thrown is. out as question, not okay. as answer. Right. We're challenging here. Now we have a gentleman waving his hand vociferously. I, I, I'm sorry, well, I, I, there's this idea we've been talking about that somehow abstract artists so inaccessible and avant. I mean, it's become so popularized. It's everywhere from Starbucks to dentist's office to screensavers. The idea that it's some kind of uh, high culture, highbrow uh, vision is just, it's just, I'm sorry, I just find that nonsense. Any thoughts? Uh, Thank you. That's an honest answer. Um, now, who else has had their hand up and has not been able to ask a question or comment? Who would like to further address this, this text from Anish Kapoor? Because there is a relationship here. Look, what is, his, what is his first word that he said, if I may, because I don't have a copy of the text. I wish to make sculpture about belief. We're in the territory of spirituality. But contest that. Pursue it. Yes. Mystics throughout time spoken that the idea is that it's our beliefs, in fact, that keep us from some authentic experience of the transcendent or spirituality or even a deeper experience of, of, of existence. You have this belief in your head, I believe in the transubstantiation or I believe in nirvana or I believe in tenure, like whatever you believe in as your kind of, right? You, you know what I mean? Like whatever you have is your, your transcendent and that's your belief. And that's one of the, the obstacles that can, in fact, prevent you that that belief, that conceptual thought formation that you have as a linguistic pattern, right? In, in, your, in your rational mind. Well, let me throw this at you. I believe that mystics are deconstructionists. I think they deconstruct those ideas, those dogmas, those doctrines. They challenge them. And very often they do it through, I mean, think of some of the mystics. Or even think of some of the, 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 the sacred scriptures. The Song of Solomon in the Bible is about as erotic as any kind of spirituality can get. Think of John Donne's poetry. These, these are very much dealing with the material, with the incarnate, with the enfleshed, with the embodied. But they're seeing that as a vehicle to spirituality. In fact, a communion that nothing else can parallel between the body and the spirit or between two human beings. Now, who else has not had a chance to ask a question, make a comment? Oh, yes, this gentleman. I 
think it's all words. I think words are getting in the way. And um, in spirituality, I believe it's feelings. And in art, I believe it's the same. And I think by discussing all this, we're putting into words things that don't are not appropriate to words. Well, unknowingly, you have introduced our next clip. Could we go to the next one? So again, it's going to be short. Oh, before we start it, I should mention this. When we talk about art and the affective dimension, psychologists employ the expression felt needs, that art, all art forms, can meet felt needs. They can also provide a way to deal with a reality that overwhelms us. We're about to meet an elderly gentleman. His name is Brooks. Brooks committed a crime early in his life, and he was incarcerated for 45 years. And by the time his life was virtually over, they decided he was no longer a threat to society, and they removed him from the prison, which had become his home, his family, his community. What happens to people? How can art enable us to negotiate, to mediate, to deal with such realities? So we'll go to this next clip. I have trouble sleeping at night. I have bad dreams like I'm falling. I wake up scared. Sometimes it takes me a while to remember where I am. Maybe I should get me a gun and, and rob the foodway so they'd send me home. I could shoot the manager while I was at it. Sort of like a, a bonus. I guess I'm too old for that sort of nonsense anymore. I don't like it here. I'm tired of being afraid all the time. I've decided not to stay. I doubt they'll kick up any fuss. Not for an old crook like me. Tell me, fuck stick, they're all addressed to you. I take it. Dear Mr. Dufresne, 
In response to your repeated inquiries, the state has allocated the enclosed funds for your library project. This is $200. In addition, the library district has generously responded with a charitable donation of used books and sundries. We trust this will fill your needs. We now consider the matter closed. Please stop sending us letters. I want all this cleared up before the warden gets back. Yes, sir. Good for you, Andy. Wow. It only took six years. From now on, I'll write two letters a week instead of one. Uh, I believe you're crazy enough. Now, you better get all this stuff out of here like the captain said. Now, I'm going to go pinch a loaf. When I come back, this is all gone, all right? Andy, do you hear that? idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. It pissed the warden off something awful. Open the door. Open it up! The frame, open this door! I am warning you, Dufresne, turn that off! Two weeks in the hole for that little stunt. On your feet. Hey, look who's here. Nice throw. Hey. You, you, you couldn't play something good, huh? 
Hank Williams or something? They broke the door down before I could take requests. Was it worth it? Two weeks in the hole? Easiest time I ever did. Oh, shit. There's no such thing as easy time in the hole. That's right. A week in the hole is like a year. Damn straight. I had Mr. Mozart to keep me company. <laughs> so they let you tote that record player down there, huh? He's in here. In, in here. That's the beauty of music. They can't get that from you. Haven't you ever felt that way about music? Well, I played a mean harmonica as a younger man. Lost interest in it, though. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Yeah, for, forget that there are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a, there's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. It's yours. What are we talking about? Hope. Hope. Let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that idea. Like Brooks did. So, yes, sir, there is a dimension of the unutterable in the arts and spirituality. That what we cannot say, cannot articulate, cannot put into words. In French, one says, indicible. It's the unsayable. And this brings, when we talked about mysticism, um, if you look in various traditions, they will talk about the inner light. For example, in the Quaker tradition or the Shaker tradition, they await a movement of the spirit within. There's actually a very well-known group in the Iberian Peninsula called the Illuminati. They await that alightening, that spiritual awakening that happens within. So, questions, comments, observations on what you've just seen, and particularly for the gentleman who already mentioned about music, and I know we have other professional music musicians in the audience. I have a lot, I, I'm ready to say, but the point here is the dialogue. So, questions, comments, observations. And if we could get a microphone to this gentleman. So then, would you say that some art forms are more predisposed? to these kind of communications and others because they possess some sort of a other means of communication? Art versus music versus language-based forms like poetry. Mm -hmm. There is a sense in, in, in theology and in spirituality of that which is totally other. In fact, that's one of the definitions of transcendence. Totally other than the material realm. That said, your question um, is asking, are there art forms, are there media that are inherently, intrinsically conducive to spirituality? I think we can challenge that. In fact, the purpose of our collective conversation tonight is to question, to investigate, and not to say, it's, this is dogma, in the art circle, this is doctrine in aesthetics, but rather to challenge the conventions there. That, and when we're talking about music, historically speaking, in some circles, music was considered the highest form of art. Why is that? This gets back to the lady's question there. Because it is so immaterial. Music, you cannot touch it, it's not material. You cannot see it. It is something that we know is happening, but we can't put it in a box. 
it was considered very much a, a spiritual art form. In fact, in the, uh, in the Greek language, the pneumatos means the spirit, the wind, the breath, and music was associated with the language of the spirit. It was that breath, it was that spirit, it was that wind that gave expression without any material manifestation. So in some sense, it was considered in certain circles the, uh, the highest form of art. But then this brings us back to what the lady asked before about would we fall into a false dichotomy of separating the material and the spiritual. And that often happens. When, when do mystics get declared heretics? When, when the institution or the doctrinal dogmatic authorities believe that now you have lost that balance. Did, did you have your hand up? Yeah, if we can get a microphone to him. I'm glad you pointed out uh, music being understood as kind of historically privileged over the other arts. That's interesting. I'm curious about the current cultural climate that we have where music is often used as a way to block out uh, outside stimulus. I think of iPod culture. You can just put in your earbuds and the rest of the world, you don't have to pay attention to it. So sure, music has this ability to elevate, transcend, take us to higher places perhaps, but it also serves a material function in our days in a way to not deal with, to block out. And so I'm curious just about that multi-functionality of music. Could you talk about that a bit? Yes. Um, I mentioned before that each summer I, I lead dialogic sessions with the composers and musicians. This last summer, we had a dialogic session with V.J. Iyer, and I highly recommend you look him up. Uh, you were there, Becky, for V.J. Iyer? Yeah. <laughs> Now, talking about breaking barriers through the arts and dissolving false dichotomies, V.J. Iyer was a child prodigy in classical violin at four years of age. And we filmed the dialogic session with him, and we hope to have that up on YouTube soon. When it is, you really want to listen to what he has to say. He talks about what the spirit of, what perfectionism does to a child's spirit how that can kill the creativity in children. And he left classical violin, but he wanted to continue to explore. So he went, uh, 20 years old, he completed his bachelor's at Yale University in mathematics. And then he wanted to see the relationship between mathematics and the hard um, sciences, so he did his master's in physics. Then he wanted to see the relationship between math, mathematics, physics, and music, and so he went to my alma mater, the University of California, Berkeley, and he did a PhD in neuroscience, cognitive acquisition of music. What's very interesting is how he's exploring the arts and the sciences. And V.J. Iyer has gone on to become one of the three greatest pianists in jazz uh, today. Um, Downbeat Magazine, look what they have to say about him, Grammy nominee. He, na he just received the um, John T. Uh, and the Catherine C. Um, MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, and he's professor at Harvard University. What V.J. Iyer said in our dialogic session is that the culture that you're referring to is an artificial culture. Music begins, has its source, its origins, in the community. It builds relationships. It is the connective tissue of, uh, of community. And he actually argues that studio music, when you take the music outside the community, you are violating the very principle on which music is founded, bringing people together. Or as they would say in the hip hop world, one nation under a groove. Um, and we hope to have that up um, on, on YouTube soon. Other questions or comments about, and I have a lot to say, but the poor person, now the gentleman back there has his hand up, if we can get a microphone to him. 
And then we have a lady up here, if we could get a microphone to her. Yeah, you mentioned Quaker and mathematics. I'm both. I'm a Quaker and a mathematician. You're I, a Quaker? I, I, oh. Yes. But I think the way I interpret Quakerism is that f I take every person as a fruit tree. If I go into a bus, I see it as a limousine of fruit trees. Mm. And I see a lot of art in it. I see a lot of uh, music in it. Because every person, I do research on what grandparents teach grandchildren. And I see all the seniors with wrinkles. And I say, it's all musical notes for me. <laughs> and, and I, when I'm getting a lot of them. So I, I say that when you say that music is untouchable. Uh, unutterable. Uh, sorry? Uh, yeah, and then the, you cannot uh, touch it, you mean? The tactile sense? Yeah, but I okay. think you don't have to be touching something to make it uh, spiritual or material. Because I think the separation of spiritual and material is a problem. I was, okay. I'm just coming from a discussion about love in, in Rumi's poem. And ah, there was yes. a whole question. Now, here's another Muslim <coughs> mystic. Yeah, so there was a whole question of God. And, and I said, why can't, because in Quaker, we believe every person is a God, has a God in it. So mm -hmm. you don't separate God as some dictator somewhere mm -hmm. trying to mm -hmm. be a woman or a man or a Asian or African and so on. So the whole question of trying to separate uh, spirituality from material for me is problematic. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. separate. I, I, I think people here are all fruit trees to me. They are very mm -hmm. fruitful. And I have no reason to doubt the, mm -hmm. the talent and the architecture of their creation. I think we should enjoy the beauty of mm -hmm. people and the environment. Well, thank you, sir. Now, this young lady had a question, and she needs a microphone. Yes. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> so just a couple of thoughts regarding this whole mystical, untouchable music discussion that we're having and how much I've recently been reading how uh, that disputes that. Uh, first of all, there is this concept that I discovered of emergence. Basically, when we're speaking about languages or any other form of communication, we shouldn't just take them so literally. Uh, we have a tendency to put concepts together in a much more complicated way when we're communicating amongst each other, and then somehow that turns into a mystical understanding that nobody really knows what it's all about, what it's actually just emergence, where the sum of all parts that you first put into something does not actually break down to all those parts. It breaks down to all those parts plus something extra, which is that understanding that you get. Um, second of all, I don't remember the name of this conductor, but he just died last year, and I listened to all Claudio this. Abado. No. No? I think he, he was from Harvard Howard or something. I, I'm really bad with names. Okay. Um, he just passed away last year, and I listened to all his lectures on music and musicality for, and he kind of portrayed them in, in lay terms, and he was talking about how music has a lot to do with us relating to various tones and in, uh, tones that we pick up during in the natural world, whether it's mm -hmm. coming from humans or, or animals or birds or whatever it is. And because we do get such a very rich uh, background of information on a, on a regular basis, you know, putting that into patterns and music makes it sound like it's something magical, but it is not as magical as we might think it is. Very good point, and that's where Vijay Iyer is coming from. As somebody who did his, his, and continues to do his research at Harvard on music cognition, it is a neurological phenomenon. Yeah. And that was my last point, um, talking about uh, how music isn't a tactile sense. If touch is just a name for a sense. I mean, if you really think about it, all of our senses are very, very refined senses of touch. You know, we touch colors with our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, the the difference in all the senses comes in in the neural area, um, which you know I kind of gave a little laugh when you said that VJ ended with studying cognitive science because that mm -hmm. is something that I've been coming back to again and again and again mm -hmm. in my discoveries. Mm -hmm. All of this that we're talking about. Yeah, in fact, what he does is he charts the physiological responses to music to sound. That is part of his research, and that gets us back to the material. But now we, we've put our finger on uh, some dimensions that we have to address before we move forward further. And 
talking about touch, one key figure here that we need to address is John Locke. John Locke, the British philosopher, but also a physician. He was very much attuned to embodied knowledge as a, as a doctor, as a physician. And he, why is he a significant in this discussion that we're having now? Well, he is one of the prime figures in what we know as the precursor of the Enlightenment. What do we owe to John Locke? Well, John Locke is the first person to propose what we now call the origins of the modern concept of the mind. And that has led to what we refer to as identity and sense of self. How did he do this? John Locke said, he argued, in, in fact, he's the first person to propose th this definition of the self. The self is the continuity of consciousness. What contribution did he make? How do we bridge that gap between the material and the spiritual, between the neurological and the aesthetic? John Locke argued that everything we know, he's one of the major figures in epistemology. That's a very fancy word for saying the philosophy of knowledge. How do we know what we know? How does cognitive acquisition take place? In other words, how do we learn? Unlike his predecessors, such as um, Descartes, Locke argued that there are no innate ideas, in, inborn concepts in the human mind. Everything we know, we know through sensory perception. This explains why he is an empiricist. The, in many respects, the, men, the, the, the source of, in, in, uh, of empiricism. So he argued, and he, he came up with the expression that we probably all know. Tabula rasa. A blank slate. He, he maintains that the human mind has nothing encrypted, nothing imprinted, that everything the human mind has, it has through experience, through sensory perception. Therefore, this undercuts the whole notion of, of a dichotomy between the material and the spiritual. Even the spiritual, we can only apprehend through sensory perception through experience. So we may dream of the stars. Yeah, we may dream, you know, we can have these high hopes. But the only way that we can attain spirituality is through sensory perception, which brings us back to the role of the art, of the artist and the arts. They're working in the realm of sensory perception. Now, I have a lot more to say on this, but let's get some questions, comments. We need a microphone here, if we may. I just want to throw out another word, uh, beauty. How does beauty fit into this? Because I think when we think of spiritual, Mm -hmm. or, work, or art that makes us feel and we talk about accessibility versus you know making sh the importance of accessibility uh, versus things that we get we construct feelings about um, I think part of the problem is we've kind of artists to, uh, have evacuated beauty I mean we don't Beauty is almost a dirty word for mm -hmm. the last 50 years or so. Um, beauty particularly in terms of accessibility to the non-artist, to the non-trained uh, eye. Um, mm -hmm. People don't strive as much. Artists don't strive necessarily for that anymore. 
Um, or if they do, it doesn't get valued. Uh, and is that part of the reason why one could argue that that's, uh, art, uh, in terms of spirituality, has gone dormant mm -hmm. uh, for the you know, last many decades, few decades? This takes us back to what the young lady said about universalizing. Who defines beauty? What are the parameters of beauty? Right. It's hard to define, but they knew it when they heard it. And that relates to the notion of consciousness. They had, they had a self-awareness through music that of their independence as a self of their identity despite the institution. What we really, what, what's very interesting here, did you notice what piece of music they were playing? Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. Why? Well, The Marriage of Figaro was written by Beaumarchais. When Beaumarchais wrote this, the, the, it was immediately censored even though he was a tutor to the, the two daughters of the King of France. But later, much later, it finally came out. Within months, very soon thereafter, Mozart, before, before the book even comes out, Mozart makes the opera. And Beaumarchais, when he hears The Marriage of Figaro, he has something very revealing to say. You can get away with something in music, that you can never get away with in literature. That the message got through. And what is Beaumarchais' novel, The, the Marriage of Figaro? It's all about aristocratic class privileges and the valet and how you break down the structures. So in this sense, you see Andy, who is literally defying conventions of the institution and bringing us back to that prophetic role that you're going to take a stance to critique the institution. But the beauty aspect is beyond all of this material. It, it transcends, if you want, all of this. And then the question is when John Cage just does four minutes of silence, mm -hmm. where, where's music, where, what does he do to music then? I mean, well, is that a problem? I mean, well, in the clip that we saw, I think we could argue in a Hegelian sense that what happens is a synthesis. There is a correspondence between their human condition and the music so that it resonates and opens up to them new vistas of what it means to be human, even when you're incarcerated. I think they're just the sound, that's all. The sound? That sound is beautiful. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think they went to incarceration or anything like that. I think the sound was beautiful here. And I didn't necessarily go to all that explanation. And there's, that's where the spirituality of that piece lies in the sense it, it touches a lot of us. Not all of us, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. necessarily all of us, but it touches inherently all of us through the sound uh, that is, I don't know where it comes from, you mm -hmm. know, biology or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there's something that touches us, um, and that's the spirituality of, the, of that. Um, but but notice how, how the, the, the character played by Morgan Freeman, how he frames that music in a very specific context. And I think one of the issues that we have to deal with is the contextuality of art. It's not in vacuo. It does not exist in a vacuum. It does not exist in isolation. And your comment at the very beginning of this discussion was arguing to what extent is art isolating itself, removing itself from the community, removing itself from the connections to the people at large. But we have to balance that with the sense that all art, we are spatial temporal beings. No human exists out of space and out of time. Everything we do must come to terms with the contours of space and time. So that, that, that context will inform any expression of beauty and may render it, may prevent it from becoming universal. 
because it is specific to that time and place. When does art become, as some would say, transcended? When it, when it speaks to all people in all places. This is what anthropologists refer to. There are certain phenomena. For, for example, we know that no human community has ever existed without music. There is something about music that every community of beings, of human beings, since the dawn of humanity, has made music. So it's reaching something there that goes to the very essence of what it means, the human condition. Yes, other questions, comments? Oh, in the clip, um, all the inmates found the marriage of Figaro beautiful. Uh, but couldn't have they been equally inspired by, say, a particularly magnificent dawn or sunset? Uh, so, in other words, inspired by nature, and not necessarily as things they could see, but maybe hear. Maybe they liked the sound of a bird. And so, does that have any implications for intelligent design, or that there's some sort of higher creator who's mm. creating the art that surrounds us? Well, I indeed, y your point is well taken, because what the clip in, uh, proposes to us is that there are material means to take us beyond the context beyond the confines of the prison, beyond space and time, because they're infusing in us a vision that is not constrained to our spatial temporal circumstances. Yes, sir. Okay, can we get a microphone to him? So, sticking in my, my throat. So okay. music, you're, I mean, we're saying it's, it's not material, but it is technically music as we know it is necessarily based on an organism that exists in this environment with air vibrations. I mean, it, it emerged on a specific planet in a specific universe with certain laws. Like it's, it's and it evokes physiological responses. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, how can we say it's non-material then? No, I'm saying there, there existed a certain school um, that considered music. I'm not saying that it is non-material. But there is a school of thought that exists in the history of musicology where it was considered the highest of the art forms because it was the most, they considered, the most immaterial. Well, because it didn't have the tactile, the visual, those kind of material properties, that's why they idealized it. Certainly, you, you can... I, I'm, I'm just trying to think. I mean, is it possible to hear sound at such, I mean, we're used to amplification where we can actually feel sound. You can feel this. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm at a loss, actually. Can you, I mean, thunder, certainly, you can feel that, that mm -hmm. sound. So w was that simply them deluding themselves that sound and music did not have a materiality? Well, this brings us back to what the young lady said. Beethoven was deaf for most of the last years of his life, but he still heard the music. Why? Because it was happening in his mind because it's neurological. He was constructing music in his mind that he could not hear. He had lost his auditory capabilities. Um, to throw another word in the mix, kind of following up on that gentleman's uh, idea around beauty, um, my word is intent. And how do those relate like how does intent and beauty maybe intent and music come together like wh when something noise and when something music because there's music in neat like a, oh maybe a waterfall falling or whatever you listen to some naturalistic cd and you hear all the sounds of nature that's pretty beautiful music i is nature having that intent or not i don't know but then like beethoven you were talking about right like he was intending to create this music, which was beautiful, so and it does like the intent do, does our like spirit manifest itself through that intent, or just kind of yeah throw, throwing well, that, that in there and, that brings us into the volitional dimension that human uh, beings are free moral agents, we have choices, we make choices, and those choices inform our art um, as far as the distinction between music and non music. Um, there's actually a Canadian who helps us greatly in this. 
the foremost Canadian composer on the international scene and one of my dialogue partners, R. Murray Schaefer. Now, R. Murray Schaefer is the one who invented, coined the expression, the soundscape. He wants to break down the barriers between this is music and this is not music. He argues that it's sound. And how we interpret that sound, the hermeneutics of it, that is informed by context and other vectors. So he, and, and you'll see MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has been pursuing a fair amount of research, breaking down these barriers between sound and music, and in fact arguing that's a false dichotomy. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. This is one of the biggest discussions in museological circles. And this is why John Cage, who was mentioned by Pierre, John Cage is prophetic. He already, when he has people listen to absolute silence for four minutes, he's compelling them to ask themselves, what is music? Incidentally, Cage pointed out the strongest sound is silence. He impelled audiences to ask themselves, what really is music? What intent am I bringing as a listener? And the gentleman who's asking about the in intent there, yes, but what is the gap between intent and interpretation? What did Merleau-Ponty say? And this gets us back to um, when we talked about John Locke and perception. Merleau-Ponty, one, one of the foremost French philosophers, said, chaque perception est une interprétation. Every perception is an interpretation. There is no way that we can perceive, have a sensorial perception without our brain instantly interpreting it. But the reality is, we don't all have the same vision. We don't all have the same hearing. We don't all have the same tactile sense. This is why we, can, we are going to have as many varied perceptions of the same art because of that reality. And that relates to our spatial temporal, our specificity. When he's asking that question, he's asking that question though, is he, is he, it just seems a bit vague to say our, we interpret it, our brain. I mean, especially with neurological studies, uh, the, the Human Connectome Project that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, does he get, does any of his work, does he start to deal with more of the specificity of what he means by that, that it's interpreted in the brain? There's a lot of parts in that galaxy there. But, but yeah, no, you're quite right. And this is what has led people like Vijay Iyer into, into music cognition. That said, his, his first principle as a philosopher is, and in fact, I think it's imperative for here, for us to point out, what, what's the difference between sound and music and what's the role of intent? I argue that in fact, and, and here I'm working with hermeneutics, that we, the science of interpretation. I argue that humans are meaning-seeking creatures. We have to find meaning. We're looking for meaning. We are on a spirit quest to find meaning in life. So we're going to interpret that. I mean, what is the relationship? We want to, in fact, that should be our last clip because I'm afraid we're going to run out of time. Um, we, even in quote unquote chance or hazard, do accidents exist or is there an intent? Is there a meaning? That leads us into the intentional aspect of what's called philosophically the teleological. Where there's always a goal, there's always an aim, there's always a destiny. There's somewhere we're headed and we're aiming for. And we are goal-oriented creatures. Yes, sir. So art and intent go hand in hand and it's not something doesn't express itself in an artistic way if it's not intending to do that. 
Um, well, is, is that is that a possibility, or can you have something that like just appears that where it's 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 not trying to be there, but it's it's still even though we can't interpret it, it's still it's an art form, but an unintended art form. Well, one of the, one of the first principles of psychology is e motions. And what's the point here? That all human beings are in a movement towards. It is impossible for us not. Many would argue that, that this is the warp and woof of the human condition. The affective dimension, the emotions, that you're moving, you're intentionally heading towards a certain goal, a certain end, a certain aim, that this is part of what it is to be human. That it is not, it's not possible to evacuate that from what humanity means. So it is implicit. It is intrinsic. It is inherent. That's what many would argue. It's the idea that we can somehow remove that dimension from us would be to truncate the full orbitedness of what it means to be a human being. F fair enough. What is one of the fundamental uh, definitions of nature and culture? And this is just a very basic, it's a reductionistic, but it might serve our purposes for our dialogue. Nature is everything that humans don't touch. Culture is everything else. Any, any human intervention is a cultural act. Whether it be in sciences, whether it be in architecture, whether whether it be in literature, any human intervention is a cultural act. And keep in mind, what is the, when we talk about aesthetics, one of the big philosophical debates is art and technology. This gentleman was pointing it out in the relationship to music. This is a word in Greek, techne, from which we can automatically identify with technology. Do you know that in Greek, technology, the, the word techne means art and skill, art and technology. We have created a division between art and technology, but in its origins, they go hand in hand. How could we understand somebody like Leonardo da Vinci? Who, for him, the sciences and the arts are kissing cousins. And my experience working with artists and scientists, I work with other neuroscientists like Dr. Ivar Mendez, who I highly recommend you, you look up. Dr. Mendez is one of the world's greatest neuroscientists, functional neuroscientists, because he works on applications. He's one of the co-creators of the Canada space arm. Now this is somebody who first wanted to explore the arts and did a BFA at the University of Toronto, but then wanted to see the relationship between the arts and the sciences. Now I should tell you, Dr. Mendez finished his BFA at 15 years old. Then he wanted to see the sciences, but he wanted the sciences that would make a difference to the human condition. So he went to med school. You can't, you can't cut corners in med school. He finished med school at 22. Then he got a postdoc, he did his PhD, and he began research. And by 26, he was a world-renowned neuroscientist because he is the creator of what is known as deep brain stimulation. Why do I do dialogic sessions with Dr. Ivar Mendez? He's also an internationally renowned sculptor and photographer. So how do we build the bridges between disciplines that we separate out Maybe we need to get back to seeing the big picture, the way the Renaissance did in people like da Vinci. Now, 
Um, before we move to our closing moments, are there any other questions or comments? Oh, we have a few. Um, we're going to get to, could I get help from Ms. Kramer and from Mr. Morelli to pick up uh, all the papers where you wrote about that, um, uh, that one quote from Anish Kapoor? Could, could you please uh, give them to either Ms. Andrea Kramer or Mr. Didier Morelli? If you could help out, we'd most appreciate that. If they could bring, please, please bring them here. And also, if we could collect the piece of paper with the emails on it so we can continue the dialogue. Oh, you okay. folks didn't get the email get sheet? Okay. So if we could get everything that you've written, and if we could get the email sheet. Now, folks, um, we can go on past 9 o'clock, but I'm sure that you folks are quite busy. Would you permit me to show you a final clip? And um, it's, it's pretty short, but I think it could help us, you know, as they say in the film, in the film industry, it's a wrap. I think it could be a wrap for us and conducive to the questions about hermeneutics, about perception, about us as meaning-seeking creatures. And I, I'm mentioning this to get back to, um, to Pierre's point about beauty and about the arts. I also maintain that humans are narrative creatures. We're natural-born storytellers. Each of us has a story that we need to tell, and more importantly, that we need people to listen to. That's the cornerstone of community. And I think that when we remember the relationship between aesthetics and spirituality. What is art? Art has a narrative. Art has a story to tell. And we can hear it. We can relate to it. We can understand it. Somehow, and that gets back to the communicative d dimension of it, there is a narrative element to art. And this has led to a whole new field of studies. They're, they're called textual studies, because scholars began to realize, wait a minute, it's not just a book that's a text. A painting is a text, because it's telling a story. A painting has a narrative arc. A sculpture is a text. We can read sculpture. We can read film. We can read music. And now, under the aegis of textual studies, they're they're taking an interdisciplinary approach. Why are they doing this? Because the common denominator is text, story, narrative. And there are so many media to tell that story in the arts. Well, we're going to look at a final clip. Uh, I think... I think we'll have to go to Magnolia. And there, there, there's so much more that, that I want to share with you, but we'll have to do that online if you've left us your emails and your names. In the New York Herald, November 26, year 1911, there is an account of the hanging of three men. They died for the murder of Sir Edmund William Godfrey, husband, father, pharmacist, and all-around gentleman resident of Greenberry Hill, London. He was murdered by three vagrants whose motive was simple robbery. They were identified as Joseph Green, Stanley Berry and Daniel Hill. Green, Berry, Hill. And I would like to think this was only a matter of chance. 
as reported in the Reno Gazette, June of 1983. There is the story of a fire, the water that it took to contain the fire, and a scuba diver named Delmer Darian. Employee of the Nugget Hotel and Casino, Reno, Nevada, engaged as a blackjack dealer. Well liked and well regarded as a physical, recreational, and sporting sort, Delmer's true passion was for the lake. Delmer died of a heart attack somewhere between the lake and the tree. But most curious side note is the suicide the next day of Craig Hansen. Volunteer firefighter, estranged father of four, and a poor tendency to drink. Mr. Hansen is the pilot of the plane that quite accidentally lifted Delmer Darian out of the water. Added to this, Mr. Hansen's tortured life met before with Delmer Darian just two nights previous. All I need is a two. All you need is a deuce. All right. That is an A. Glad you like my work. All right, moment of truth. The weight of the guilt and the measure of coincidence so large, Craig Hansen took his life. But I am trying to think this was all only a matter of chance. The tale told at a 1961 awards dinner for the American Association of Forensic Science by Dr. John Harper, president of the association began with a simple suicide attempt. 17-year-old Sidney Barringer in the city of Los Angeles on March 23rd, 1958. The coroner ruled that the unsuccessful suicide had suddenly become a successful homicide. To explain, the suicide was confirmed by a note in the right hip pocket of Sidney Barringer. At the same time, young Sidney stood on the ledge of this nine-story building. An argument swelled three stories below. The neighbors heard, as they usually did, the arguing of the tenants, and it was not uncommon for them to threaten each other with a shotgun or one of the many handguns kept in the house. And when the shotgun accidentally went off, Sydney just happened to pass. What? Shut the fuck up! Added to this, the two tenants turned out to be Faye and Arthur Barringer, Sydney's mother and Sydney's father. When confronted with the charge, which took some figuring out for the officers on the scene of the crime, Faye Barringer swore that she did not know the gun was loaded. She always threatens me with a gun, but I don't keep it loaded. And you didn't load the gun? Why would I load the gun? A young boy who lived in the building, sometimes a visitor and friend to Sidney Barringer, said that he had seen, six days prior, the loading of the shotgun. Ricky, come here a minute! It seems that all the arguing and fighting and all of the violence was far too much for Sidney Barringer, and knowing his mother and father's tendency to fight, he decided to do something. He said that he wanted them to kill each other, and that's all that they wanted to do is to kill each other, and that he would help them do that if that's what they wanted to do. Sidney Barringer jumps from the ninth floor rooftop. His parents argue three stories below. Her accidental shotgun blast hits Sidney in the stomach as he passes the arguing sixth floor window. He is killed instantly, but continues to fall, only to find, five stories below, a safety net installed three days prior for a set of window washers that would have broken his fall and saved his life, if not for the hole in his stomach. So Faye Barringer was charged with the murder of her son, and Sidney Barringer noted as an accomplice in his own death. And it is in the humble opinion of this narrator that this is not just something that happened. This cannot be one of those things. This, please, cannot be that. And for what I would like to say, I can't. This was not just a matter of chance. Huh. These strange things happen all the time. This is, this is Paul Thomas Anderson, who is actually arguing in this film for intelligent design. Because if you watch the film, you'll see a, a 
de sex machina. God intervenes, frogs start falling from the sky, and everybody's lives are turned upside down. He is challenging the notion that chance exists, that there is something that's truly random. And this gets us back to the idea of intent, that as emotive creatures, there is always intent. Now, some closing comments, questions, observations, because we're going to wrap it up here. Please, vis-a-vis -vis th this notion here of what we just saw. If you would emphasize so much on intent interpretation and meaning seeking, then does it not render us to solipsism? That not only I'm the um, center of the universe, but I am the universe that we'll never get out of the brain. Well, you see, what, what Paul Thomas Anderson does in this film is that he continually impels us to look for meaning in every event that he narrates in the film. What is the light motif in Magnolia? The weather. How often do you get a weather report in that film? It comes again. It's literally a light motif. It comes again and again. Why does Paul Thomas Anderson do that? Because there's nothing that we consider more random, more a matter of chance, more out of our control than weather. And he wants to challenge that anything exists that, that we're that we cannot find meaning in. Right here, we're trying to find meaning and intent, and that's how he opens. That's his overture to the entire film. There has to be meaning. There has to be, why does there have to be meaning? Why are we hermeneutical, why are we interpreters? Because we have to make sense of the human condition. And that's what artists in, often can endeavor to do. And that's a relationship with spirituality. Why does religion exist? Because we're trying to make meaning out of life. Philosophers refer to this as ultimate questions. Religion, spirituality, endeavors to answer ultimate questions. That's how Paul Thomas Anderson opens. And I would argue that's what aesthetics does too. Aesthetics is trying, art is trying to make sense, to give meaning. Yes, sir. Uh, so to take maybe a concept from the life of Pi, then religion provides a story. It may be a false story, but it's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. Well, th this gets us into, um, as a historian, into mytho-history. It's not that it's necessarily true, but it enables us to make sense of our collective existence. That's why human beings create myths. They become the narrative to which we can all relate. We're all reading from the same page, in other words, thanks to myth. In fact, that's one of the founding um, features of any culture. They've got a common narrative that they share to, among themselves. And as I mentioned, I, I did my PhD in religion, culture, and politics. Specifically, how do you end up with nationalism? You end up with nationalism when you create a collective narrative that everybody buys into. Other questions, comments, observations? Yes. Oh, there's so many things to say, but uh, I actually wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the transitional object, transitional space, um, because um, I'm studying expressive arts therapy, mm. and one of, uh, a, a lot of our research is kind of goes back to transitional objects in space and, and how the arts um, work transformatively in, in people's lives and psyches. So if you could just speak a little bit more to that, because it was a major... Well, I, I believe the, the key here is the fact that it bridges the gap between the material and the spiritual. It enables us to move from that, what uh, Anish uh, Kapoor calls, material concern to our inner concerns, to the affective, to our, 
our deepest, darkest nightmares and to our highest hopes. But we only deal with these through the material vehicles that we call art. Other questions or comments? Well, I would like to thank Jessica. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Alex, who's filmed. And uh, Elise, who's overseen all of these, uh, um, what's taking place this evening. Uh, a heartfelt thanks to SFU, to the, the Gold Corp Center, to Ms. Andrea Kramer. You have no idea how many emails have been exchanged between Montreal and Vancouver for this to come about. Um, to Mr. Am Yohal, um, who's uh, in charge of these activities. And once again, a particular personal thanks to an artist, a critical theorist, who dared to get the ball rolling to make this happen, Mr. Didier Morelli. <laughs> I'd be happy to speak with you in person if you want afterwards. Um, thank you all for coming and for your patience.